is the first of two lessons we're going to have in kind of like intro to metabolism and metabolic logic. We're going to be looking at how ATP gets its power in this lesson and then like how reactions are favorable or not favorable, the idea of steady state versus equilibrium, and then next class we'll actually go and we'll look at how ATP is able to power unfavorable reactions. So we're officially entering the part of our class on metabolism and you're a lot more familiar with metabolism than you are with other concepts just because your body is metabolizing all the time. So by metabolism, we basically just mean the making of molecules, which we refer to as anabolism, and the breakdown of molecules, which we refer to as catabolism. We have to do catabolism in order to gain the energy and building blocks in order to do that anabolism. So in order to make things, we need to break things. And there's a lot of different pathways and it can get kind of overwhelming, but really let's start by focusing on the fundamentals. You don't need to memorize a bunch of stuff in order to kind of realize the fundamental things that are going on that are going to just show up over and over and over again. So metabolism is kind of like a complex subway system. So there are pathways for making and breaking diverse molecules, um, and these are going to be richly interconnected. So instead of like just straight um, arrows, you're going to see like all sorts of like spider webby maps and things. So things might look like they're drawn out in these nice, neat pathways, um, but really it is more just like a complex subway system. And you can technically pretty much get anywhere from anywhere, but it might not be efficient and it could be expensive. Um, and there usually exists some path or paths to build any molecule from the parts of any other molecule, but not every route is accessible from every station. And some metabolic machinery is only made in certain locations and or at specific times. And so later in the course, we'll talk about how um, like things can be regulated, how our bodies regulate the action of various enzymes and various pathways and how like certain things only will happen in our liver or in our kidneys. One thing that comes into play with all of this is the idea of anaplerotic reactions, which are reactions that generate pathway intermediates. Now it can get kind of confusing when we're dealing with metabolism because right now, now we're dealing with intermediates of our metabolic pathway, which are not intermediates like we had in our enzyme reactions. In our enzyme reactions, we had like intermediate steps um, where we had like the where we had like intermediates in our reaction where we had some sort of like step in the middle of forming the product, and so that was going to be like our tetrahedral intermediate something where we had covalent bonds, so it wasn't a transition state, but it was just in this one reaction. When we talk about metabolism, here our intermediates are going to be like an intermediate in this overall pathway. So not in a single reaction, but in a pathway. So each of these things could be considered intermediates. And because we're going to be taking intermediates away from these various pathways, well, then we kind of have to replenish them. And in order to replenish them, we have to use what we call anaplerotic reactions. So basically, these will just regenerate the pathway intermediates so that when we take them off a different subway state um, stops, basically, we still have the, that um, we still have more cars coming in the train to be in, taken off into other pathways. So we will talk about anaplerotic reactions, as well as anabolism and catabolism. Some of the main pathways that we're going to focus on, there are three kind of big ones we're going to focus on. And this is going to be glycolysis. So this is going to be the breakdown of like sugars. And then the tricarboxylic acid cycle this is sometimes called the Krebs cycle, sometimes called the citric acid cycle and then the um, oxidative phosphorylation. Basically what happens is that through, through these processes, which are combined called cellular respiration, your body is breaking down glucose, um, or you can join at other parts of this pathway. But what, the, what these have in common is you're doing a series of oxidation reactions. Remember, oxidation is the loss of electrons, and what's happening in these reactions is basically you're losing electrons that you're transferring onto molecules like NAD8, NAD+, and FAD, and what this is going to do is those are going to serve as carriers that are going to carry those electrons 
um, through this oxidative, um, through this electron transport chain in the mitochondria, and the movement of those electrons from something that wants them less to something that wants them more, and oxygen's like that's the king of wanting them more. And so ultimately, you get to oxygen. Uh, you're passing electrons onto oxygen, and therefore you're generating a large amount of energy that can be used in order to create ATP. And so today I want to talk more about how AT, why, why we want to create ATP. What's the goal of ATP? What's the purpose of ATP? Well, it's kind of like an arcade token for your body. Your cells can use ATP as kind of like this storm of energy money that they can cash in on different reactions. And you can have all of these different foods broken down. You can have those complex pathways all kind of lead to ATP. And so basically, no matter what you start with, you can get energy that you can then go spend in all sorts of reactions. So today we're going to talk about like why ATP is so valuable. And it's not just a simple thing that basically um, when you break it, you're releasing those negative charges. That's part of it. But what's really a part, a huge part of it too, is going to be actually controlling the concentration of ATP so that we have a high concentration of ATP compared to ADP and AMP. And therefore we're going to, through Le Chatelier's print, um, Le Chatelier's principle, we're going to be like driving our reaction towards our products of a reaction that was already really favorable. So we're going to talk about inherent favorability as well as kind of the favorability under the current condition. And then we're going to talk about how we can use energy from reactions like the hydrolysis of ATP in order to drive less favorable reactions, like where we're actually trying to piece together DNA letters or piece together um, amino acids and things like this, things that are going to require energy, we can make them possible by coupling them to something that is going to give us energy. And so this is another key concept of my of bioenergetics and like metabolism is this idea of energy coupling. Let's say we have an inherently favorable reaction, such as that breakdown of ATP. First off, why doesn't that ATP, if it's so favorable, why doesn't it just break down all the time? Well, part of that is that it has like on its own, part of that has got a huge activation barrier. And so we can have ATP and we can have ADP plus PI. And so basically what can happen is that this will be much more favorable. We'll have this very large negative delta G, but what's gonna happen is we have this huge activation barrier. And so remember, what did we say could lower the activation barrier? Yeah, enzymes are able to lower that activation barrier, but they're not able to change the, 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 the favorability of it overall, this delta G. What this means is that no matter how much enzyme you have in there, what's going to happen is at the end of the day, if you let things reach equilibrium, you're going to end up with some concentration of your products to your reactants. So in this case, it would be ADP plus inorganic phosphate, so just a free phosphate. And then what you'd have is you'd end up with a ratio of your ADP to your PI over the concentration of your ATP. And no matter what you start with, you're gonna end up with that same ratio. And this is the idea of the law of max action. And we'll talk more about it in a minute, but basically the more favorable your reaction is, the more of your products you'll have in um, at once you reach that equilibrium, but you're always gonna reach that same equilibrium. All an enzyme can do is make it faster to reach that equilibrium, but it can't change that equilibrium. Think about this a little intuitively. So let's take a reaction and we'll say it's like a favorable reaction. So basically, if you let it go to equilibrium, you would have more products than reactants. So we take some equation, we go R2P, and basically we're gonna say at equilibrium, we basically have P, a little bit of R. And this is going to be equal to that KEQ. So what this is going to be saying is that no matter how much R and P we start with, we're going to end up with them getting to that ratio. 
So now let's go and we imagine that we start with equal amounts of them. So I'm gonna drop the concentrations um, brackets just for simplicity. But say you start with something like this, which as we'll see is akin to what we're thinking about under standard conditions, where we have equal amounts of products to reactants. In this case, we're going to have less products than we kind of like want, than we would find at equilibrium. And so in order to get to equilibrium, we're going to have to make more products. So over time, that's what we're going to do. We're going to make more products, which is going to take away some reactants. We're going to make more products, which is going to take away more reactants. We're going to take more pro make more products and take away more reactants. And then what's going to happen is that we're going to stop. I don't know how to draw a stop sign very well. Um, but basically what's going to happen is that there's we've reached reached equilibrium. So basically the conditions that we have, like any, at any point we can call, we can do that ratio, we can call it Q. And basically what we're saying here is that once our Q equals our KEQ, there's no drive. And so over here, we had strong drive. strong drive to the right. But then we went to the right. We started making more product until eventually we got to that point where we had enough products that we that we were at equilibrium. Our ratio of products to reactants was at equilibrium. There was no drive to move. And that's what happens at equilibrium is your Q equals your KEQ. There's no further drive to move. You've reached equilibrium. What if you started with even more reactants? So we started one to one here, but what if you were to start with something like this? Well, now you would have really strong drive. Now you have further to go before you reach equilibrium. There's more drive to do so. You're gonna release more energy along the way. But what if you start with too much product? If you start with too much product compared to reactants, well, now you're actually going to have a drive to the left. You're gonna start losing your products in order to make some more of your reactants. And so basically, that's not a very good, it's very hard to like draw these out, but basically what's gonna happen is you're gonna lose product, lose product, make reactants. And that's true no matter like how favorable it seemed like it was originally. No matter how inherently favorable that reaction might seem, if you start with more of the reactant, more of the products than you have, yeah, you would have at equilibrium, well, now you're going to go backwards. And so how do we maintain things in a state where we're going to be going towards that, we, we we're continuously have that drive to go towards equilibrium? We have that drive to move. That means that we, by definition, can't be at equilibrium. So at equilibrium, there's no drive to do anything. But that's only if you're at, at equilibrium. Now, sometimes if you want a big drive, you want to make sure that things go in one direction. You want to make sure that your ATP is a good fuel source. There are times when you want to be really far from that equilibrium. But a lot of the times, you actually want to be close to the equilibrium, but not at it. When you're close to the equilibrium board there, it's easy to tip the scale in either direction. And well, why is that important? That's important because remember, we have anabolism and catabolism. We need to be able to make molecules and break molecules. And a lot of the times we want to be able to kind of like use the same equipment in order to do this. And so basically what we're going to see is that in cases like glycolysis, for example, you'll see that some of these are shown as like a lot of these are shown as basically these reversible arrows. Now, everything is theoretically, is theoretically reversible. Nothing is theoretically irreversible, but some of them have such a, um, such a negative delta G that we consider them irreversible. And these are going to be the ones that are super duper far from equilibrium. And these are going to be the points that we're going to want to regulate. These are going to be the points that we can do this regulation, the points that we can drive things forward, the kind of like go or no go points, the points of commitment. And we'll talk more and more, lots and more about how those are regulated.
But a lot of the time you'll see that these free energy differences aren't that much. And so what's going to happen is basically when you're near that equilibrium, slight changes in the concentration of these things can have a big effect on what direction things go. Because remember, those enzymes can catalyze things in both directions. And so they only let you reach equilibrium faster. And so depending on whether we're a little more towards one or a little more towards the other, the enzyme is going to be able to help speed you up to get there no matter what. And so when we look at some of the like um, free energy changes, the actual free energy changes for like carbohydrate metabolism, we'll see that a lot of these are actually going to be near equilibrium, but then there are going to be ones that definitely aren't near equilibrium. And we'll come back to this idea when we talk more about these metabolic pathways and we go in detail into glycolysis. But today we're going to focus mainly on how we get a reaction to be really, really favorable so that this ATP is useful for favoring these unfavorable reactions, for driving reactions, um, basically being far from equilibrium. We're going to keep it so that we have a lot more of those reactants. We want to start, we want a situation like this. We want a strong drive. We want something where we have things taking us in the direction that we want. But there's kind of a problem. Do you see it? As we go and we make more of that product, well, now we're losing our power to be able to make more of the product. And so if we want to keep things so that we can keep making more, we're going to have to keep feeding the pathway. And so this is a key thing that we're going to see too, is basically we're going to have to keep adding R, have to keep adding R, and or using P to keep this going. And it turns out that doing this, we're actually able to control, to keep the products, keep product formation going. But if we're constantly changing things, it might seem like how do your cells ever like manage if levels are just fluctuating so much? There's like, whoa, we'd like that equilibrium where things are steady, right? But there's an alternative. There's this thing called the steady state, where basically what can happen is that in equilibrium, what we would say was that we had this constant ratio of P over R, only because we had this equals this in terms of we had the rate of which we were going from our reactants to products equal the rate at which we were going from our products to reactants. And therefore, the on net, they're not changing. So every time we make a product, we break it down to for, we um, go the other direction and make more of the reactants. But at steady state, what happens is that basically P over R is able to stay constant because you're constantly replenishing if you take. So basically, if you want to be able to use that product that we made, so for example, if we had this pathway where we had our reactants and we had the products, well, basically, if we want to this, want to lower this, well, there's a couple of ways we could either use it or we can kind of ship it out. And we'll see both of these strategies made, used. And what that's going to do is that's going to bring down the, the product concentration. You're going to be driven to the right, good old Le Chatelier's. And so by doing this, then what you're able to do is you're kind of able to keep the drive going. But eventually, you're going to run out of your reactants. So you need to keep replenishing this. So basically, steady state is able to keep a constant level of a metabolic intermediate despite being away from equilibrium.
So what happens by forming, which can be multiple routes and consuming, which can also be via multiple routes or otherwise removing those intermediates at equal rates. So you're basically, you're forming it and you're removing it somehow, basically by using it, by siphoning it off to another pathway, by taking it out of the cell, um, otherwise removing them at equal rates to the rate at which you are forming it. And this is in contrast to equilibrium, where basically the rates of forming and unforming were equal. So what, what's this big difference? Well, the big difference is that unlike equilibrium, it allows the concentrations of reactants and products to change and allows them to be in this state where basically you have a fairly constant amount of that intermediate. So you're able to kind of like have a basic, some sense of control, but you're also able to be stay in that state where you have a drive to move. You have a drive to forward things to react. You have a drive. And so this steady state concept is gonna be really important. And if we have a drive, if we have things out of whack in a way that basically instead of being at equilibrium, we have things away from equilibrium, we have that strong drive to have a reaction happen, well, then we can take reactions that have a very strong, favorable drive, things like the hydrolysis of ATP, and we can use the energy from that to couple it to something that has um, that actually even has like a positive delta G. So basically it's something that's inherently unfavorable. We can actually get it to go. We can give it the energy it needs to get over the barrier. And then kind of once it's gotten over the barrier, then we can siphon it off into other pathways. So we don't even have to worry about it going backwards too much. And so basically we're able to kind of manipulate conditions inside of our cells to make life happen. And so let's give a little more numbers, a little more technical details into how we can think about kind of the inherent favorability as well as the, the favorability under the current conditions. So before we start, just, just a reminder that basically remember that the enzymes, they can only change this activation barrier. They can only change how big that hump is. And so we have that big activation barrier keeping us from breaking down that ATP just like on a whim, which is great because we don't want it just like going off all over the place. Instead, we can use enzymes to kind of do things in a series of reactions that are able to be more possible and that are also then able to be coupled to other reactions. You're able to have more control instead of just take being like a tree burning and releasing a ton of energy, which would not be helpful. Um, we want to introduce that. We want to take away that energy like piecewise. And that's what we can do with this, all these complex pathways of metabolism. Okay, so let's go back and think about how we can talk about inherent favorability. I know I don't really like math, uh, but we're gonna have to do some math and some, some, some critical thinking. I want you guys focusing on the concepts. Don't get bogged down in like actual, too much about the actual numbers, but I do want you to be able to do some basic calculations and we'll do some examples as well as um, do some examples in class. But for any reaction, so it could be our ATP, it could be anything, um, basically we have this equation, the KEQ. So remember that this is what we were talking about kind of informally before. Um, and this is going to be like our products over reactants. Tells how you'll often see it. Um, but it's important to know that basically um, in the case where you have like some stoichiometric like coefficients and stuff. So if it wasn't a one-to-one -one relationship, you then have to take those into account when you do the um when you're writing this equation. And you also need to remember to multiply and not add if you have multiple reactants and or products. And so we'll look at some examples. But bottom line, you end up with some ratio of products to reactants. And this is telling you if you let things reach equilibrium, you're going to have this ratio. This KEQ is going to be greater than one if the products are thermodynamically favorable. So if you have more products than reactants at your equilibrium, your KEQ is going to be greater than one. But if you have more of your reactants than products at equilibrium, that means that your KEQ is going to be less than one. So KEQ greater than one, thermodynamically favored, KE Q less than one, reactants are favored. So this is not thermodynamically favorable in the forward direction.
Okay, and so when we talk about thermodynamic favorability, well, you should be thinking, that rings a bell. Um, Gibbs, is Gibbs is ringing in my head. Um, so Gibbs free energy change, or delta G. So remember that if delta G is positive, the reaction is thermodynamically unfavorable as written. Remember that because when you have a reversible reaction, basically we're saying if we're saying it, it's not favorable in the forward direction, well, then it's got to be favorable in the reverse direction. And so if delta G is positive, it's thermodynamically unfavorable in the forward direction, but favorable in the reverse direction. And if delta G is negative, the reaction is thermodynamically favorable in the forward direction, but not in the negative, the backwards direction. And if your delta G is zero, the reaction is at equilibrium. And that's what we talked about before. There's like no favorable, it's not favorable either way. There's no drive to do anything. And so I talked about how we want to keep things like away from delta from equilibrium. Um, but some things we do want to be closer to equilibrium so that we can more easily go back and forth. But then there are times when we with things like ADP where we really want to make them away from inter away from equilibrium so that we can better basically use that as a source of energy. So we'll talk more about this in a minute. Um, but basically, when you're at equilibrium, you have a delta G of zero. Now, what we typically see is this thing called a delta G naught. Um, and sometimes you'll see delta G naught prime, which we'll talk about in a second. And this is basically a way to tell us about inherent favorability. So as we were talking about, basically, we had that drive to move when we were far from equilibrium and no drive when we we're at equilibrium. So how do we give how do we give molecules a sort of like measure of how favorable they are if the favorability is going to depend on the concentrations. Well, what we do is we use this thing called the standard free energy change, which basically says that if you start with quote unquote standard conditions, which we'll um, define in a minute, of reactants and products, where these are going to be equal amounts of reactants and products, how much free energy would you release or would you need in order to reach equilibrium? If your reaction is inherently like unfavorable in the forward direction, that's going to be po a positive delta G naught. So basically, this is saying that you're going to have more reactants than products when you reach equilibrium. It's going to be negative if the reaction is inherently favorable, just like we're used to with delta Gs being negative and favorable. Um, so basically, you'd have more products than reactants when you reach that equilibrium. And if you have a delta G naught of zero, or delta, um, then basically your reactants and your products are equally favored and you'll have equal amounts of them when you reach equilibrium. And so by kind of doing this, we were able to have a way to compare between, between different conditions and kind of like figure out what direction things might go based on where they are under those standard conditions. Because as we'll see, there's a way we can go between the standard conditions and the actual conditions. But what are these standard conditions? Basically, the standard free energy change, um, so this is gonna be a physical constant of the reaction, is under the chemistry, under the chemistry definitions of the standard state, would be all reactants and products at one molar concentrations, um, one atmosphere for gases, and a temperature of 298 Kelvin or 25 degrees Celsius. Are these reasonable though? Let's look just about water. What did we say that the concentration of water was? It's like 55 molar. So that's not reasonable. And well, what would the pH be if the concentration of protons was one molar? So remember back to our good old pH. pH equals the log of one over our proton concentration. And if we're saying that our proton concentration is one molar, that would be one over one equals log of one equals zero. Yeah, I'd say that's not very reasonable. So instead, biochemists are like, okay, we'll do we'll do like a transformed uh, standard condition. So basically, this is what you see with delta G um, delta G prime naught. Sometimes you'll see it written delta G not prime. Um, this is a standard transform free energy change under the biochemistry definitions of standard state. Basically, where we say, okay, the pH is not going to be zero. The pH will be seven. Um, water concentration is 55.5 molar. Um, and magnesium is one millimolar.
That being said, we often use these terms like delta G naught and delta G naught prime kind of interchangeably, and I probably will, um, but just note that there is that difference. But in biochemistry, we're often dealing with that delta G naught prime. Okay, so this actually relates directly to our KEQ. So going back to that KEQ, we can actually think about G, we can think about delta G naught in terms of our KEQ. So for a reaction that's at equilibrium, we can determine this delta G naught, G naught, uh, delta G naught equals minus RT um, times the natural log of KEQ, where KEQ, remember, that's our concentration of our products over reactants. So R, that's just our gas constant, T, temperature in Kelvin. Um, and then this delta G naught, that's our standard free energy change. And so same exact thing you'll see with like delta G naught prime um, under the biochemistry standard conditions. That would just be delta G naught prime here and KEQ prime here. So yeah, just good old physical constants. I'll give you any that you need in order to do calculations. These are some of the key ones. Um, so if you're going between like Celsius and Kelvin, um, thinking about RT, um, those sorts of things. But bottom line, if KEQ is greater than one, well, what's that saying? Remember that products, that's products over reactants. And we said that if Ke product, we had more products than reactants over at equilibrium, our reaction was going to be favorable. And so if our reaction is favorable, then what's going to happen is we're going to have a negative delta G, right? And well, if KEQ is less than one, basically that's saying that we have more reactants than products at equilibrium. So our reaction is unfavorable in the forward direction. And so our delta G naught is positive. And in fact, by putting these numbers, we can see that this relationship is actually exponential. And so if you have a, for a small change in the delta G, you get a big change in your KEQ. So basically at zero to two kilocals, per, uh, zero kilocals per mole. Basically, remember that's our equilibrium. That's our KEQ is one. Our concentration of products to reactants is one. If you're around like zero to two kilocals per mole, um, basically you have um, some of each. Once you get to like two to five kilocals per mole, you're mostly going to have one or the other. And if you're greater than five kilocals per mole, then once you reach that equilibrium, if you reach that equilibrium, you're going to have almost all of one. So remember that this, basically this, we have a positive delta G, unfavorable. And here we have negative delta G. And this is going to be favorable. And then again, in terms of our KEQ, this is going to say that our products is greater than our reactants. And over here, it would be that our reactants are going to be greater than our products. So we can go back and forth between KEQ and um, delta G naught prime or delta G naught. And the value of having these like standard conditions, no matter how like unrealistic they are, is that basically then we have tables we can go and we can look them up in. And we can say, okay, under these conditions, we know that this will have this standard free energy change. Um, and we'll see how we can do some calculations with this. But those aren't actually the usual con conditions. Even taking into account the water and the pH with our biochemistry stand um, transform constants and things, they're still not usual. And so we need to account for this in our calculations of delta G. How do we figure out when we were at that state where we were far from equilibrium? How do we figure out, how can we actually calculate the drive to actually go towards equilibrium? We need to basically figure out the actual free energy change, that delta G. So not the delta G not, not the delta G not prime, but the actual just like in this moment, delta G. And so this is going to be, um, in order to do this, basically we're going to need to still, we'll still do basically the exact same thing. But here, instead of having KEQ, we have the reaction quotient, quotient Q. So this is the generic, just like we had like products over reactants for our, um, for the, what you call it, for the KEQ. We have the same thing here. 
except that we call it Q and it's not at equilibrium. So it's just like in this moment, under these conditions, what is the concentration of products over the concentration of reaction reactants? And again, the same caveats about multiplying, not adding, um, and raising this, the coefficients if needed. So now we can basically do that. We can put this into our equation and we can write the, the current free energy in terms of our delta G naught or delta G naught prime and the Q. So we get this equation where delta G equals delta G naught prime or delta G naught um, plus RT times the natural log of Q. Um, so this Q is also called the mass action ratio. And it's just, just like you had with equilibrium, except you're not at equilibrium. And because you're not at equilibrium, or I mean, like if you weren't at equal, you were at equilibrium, this would cancel out. But when you're not at equilibrium, then this is going to help you see what your actual drive is. And so to show you that, yes, what this is kind of like the exact same equation as we saw before. Well, before we had just simplified it. Because basically, so we know we could write delta G in terms of delta H minus T delta S. And this is a, just a different way that we can basically write delta G. So both of these are ways that we could write delta G. Um, and in terms of this delta G equal to delta G naught plus RT times the natural log of products over reactants. Well, we're saying that at what equilibrium, products um, over reactants is equal to our KEQ. And if we're at equilibrium, then delta G is going to be zero. Remember, that's where we have no drive. And so basically, then um, zero would be, our, if we plug zero in for delta G and we plug KEQ in for our um, products over reactants, then we get zero equals delta G naught plus RT line Q. Um, and then basically, if we rearrange that, we get that um, K that delta G, or then basically we rearrange that, we get that delta G naught equals minus RT line um, KEQ, which is what we saw before. And then we can further arrange this if we wanted to solve for KEQ knowing delta G naught. And we'll do an example where we actually do this. But this is at equilibrium. But now what about at any time? Well, at any time we can, do, we can use our mass action ratio Q and plug that in. And now delta G equals delta G naught plus RT um, times the natural log of Q, which is the same equation we had up here, but we could just simplify it because we knew that we were at equilibrium. Um, and therefore our Q was really our KEQ and our delta G was zero. We can rewrite this formula in various ways. And one of the ones that I find the most helpful is basically delta G equals the minus um, RT times the natural log of KEQ over Q. And why I like writing it like this is because it shows explicitly this how the delta G is relate, related to and dependent on the ratio of your KEQ and Q. So it's not good enough how inherently favorable that reaction is under those standard conditions. We need to know what are the conditions right now, because that's really what's going to drive what something happens. So let's think about how we can make this reaction negative or positive. First off, what do we want? Well, if we want our reaction to go into the forward direction, we're going to want to make this negative. But in order to make this whole side of the equation negative, if we wanted to make this whole right side of the equation negative, basically we're going to have to make this positive. And when you take a natural log of something that's greater than one, you're going to get a positive number. And if you take a natural log of something that's less than one, you're going to get a negative number. And so how are we going to get this to be positive? Well, we need our KEQ over Q to be greater than one. And so if we're saying that our KEQ is greater than Q, basically what we're saying is that at equilibrium, we would have more products than we have right now. And so we need to go in the forward direction, right? So if KEQ is greater than, one, than Q, basically you have the drive to go forward. But What's going to happen is that if your Q is greater than your KEQ, basically that would be saying that you have more of your products um, currently than you would have at equilibrium. And so you're going to actually go backwards. It would be unfavorable in the forward direction. This would turn out to be negative. A negative times a negative equals a positive, and your delta G would be positive. So to summarize, and these are really important points that I want you guys to know, if your Q is greater than KEQ, 
delta G will be positive and the reaction will be driven towards reactants. If Q is less than KEQ, delta G will be negative, reaction will be driven towards products. If Q equals KEQ, then delta G will be zero, the reaction is at equilibrium, and there's no net change in concentrations of products or reactants. And if they're within one to two orders of magnitude of each other, the reaction is going to be near equilibrium. But how do we get it away from equilibrium? Basically, we saw how whether you're larger than or greater than one, your ratio was going to determine whether it was favorable or unfavorable in the forward direction. But that's not enough. We want to know how favorable or how unfavorable. And so it's actually the kind of the magnitude of the ratio is going to tell us like the magnitude of how favorable or how unfavorable it is. How much energy would be released from this or how much energy would we need to make this happen? And so as the ratio of KEQ um, to Q gets bigger, what that's going to mean is that your reaction gets more favorable. There's more products that you need to kind of make in order to reach that equilibrium. But as that Q gets bigger, well, now it's going to get um, that, to a smaller and smaller fraction. Um, and basically, that's going to make it more and more, that number more and more negative, which is going to make the side of the equation, the whole equation, more and more positive. So the further you get from equilibrium, the more energy that's needed or given off to get to equilibrium. And therefore, the thermodynamic favorability and molecular like usefulness is highly dependent on concentrations. And so how favorable a reaction, how far from equilibrium? And this means that even if you have a reaction in which the delta G naught prime is actually positive, you can have a situation where your concentrations are so out of whack, your Q is basically so much smaller than your KEQ that you're able to make this, this reaction is actually going to be favorable. If you have so much more of your reactants than products, you can kind of overcome that barrier. Because even just if you think about things probabilistically, well, if you have a lot of reactants and not a lot of products, even if they kind of just like accidentally change into products, um, basically, even if it's not very favorable, if it happens, basically, it has more chances to happen because you have more of those reactants. And so if you have, a, you're far from that equilibrium, you're um, in terms of your KEQ and your Q, well, now there's going to be basically a stronger drive to move. And that drive to move might be enough to overcome the inherent unfavorability, the inherent um, fact that, yeah, you're still at equilibrium. You're still going to end up with having more of your reactants than your products. But we have so much more pre reactants pro in the current state that we're still able to transform some of those pro into products, and that'll still be favorable. And so you can think about basically how much of a barrier you'd have to make up is going to depend, though, on your delta G naught prime. And so basically, the bigger positive that would be, the further from equilibrium you would need to be in order to make that reaction actually go. But if that is smaller, then it's, more, it's easier to go back and forth. And therefore, we can kind of have reactions in which we keep them. Um, we have that have a fairly, um, fairly neutral delta G naught prime. And we can therefore control, like we can do things in the forward and reverse direction. And we can control which direction things go by controlling those concentrations. And then things that are inherently favorable, well, they also are going to depend on the concentrations. And so this is actually one of the reasons why ATP gets its power. So let's talk about good old ATP, that like energy storage for our cells. I like to think of it as this like arcade token, like I said, that you can kind of like cash in in different places. Um, we'll talk more about how molecules can actually add ATP, add phosphate groups from ATP. When we talk about just like a free floating phosphate group, we say this like this inorganic phosphate, um, this we call it like orthophosphate. If you have two of these, we abbreviate it like PPI and that's a pyrophosphate. Um, kinases are molecules that um, are enzymes that add phosphate groups and phosphatases are, can remove them.
Um, and as we'll see, we can kind of attack at any of these phosphate positions. So we can transfer a phosphate group, we can transfer um, a, a dental group, or we can transfer like an, an AMP, AMP group. So the reason why ATP is like useful as money is because, well, we get a lot of energy when we use it. And we can use that energy to drive other reactions. And by kind of using all um by kind of all these enzymes and things, kind of specializing to use the same form of energy. Well, therefore, we don't have to stock up on a whole bunch of different types of energy that all these different molecules like. Instead, we kind of have this universal currency. So you can see from its del delta G naught prime that ATP, the hydrolysis of ATP, um, so water is not shown in this equation, but what you really have, what you really have is ATP plus water is going to give you this um, ATP plus RPI. But the water basically is, we, we consider the concentration of water to be constant because remember it's got that 55.5 molar concentration. And so we just ignore it and think about it like this. But it is a hydrolysis reaction that we're looking at right here. And it's a favorable one. It's energetically favorable, at least under standard state conditions. So we can see that it ha gives off a, it has a standard state um, delta G not prime of minus 7.3 kilocals per mole. So remember minus, we're basically favorable. And why is this? There are several different reasons and it's not as simple as you might've thought. The easiest thing for me that I like to think about that's like easiest to grasp your head around is kind of the, the freeing the charge repulsion. So I like to think about ATP as kind of like those three phosphate groups as kind of being like a tight um, a spring and that you have clamped. Those negative charges of the phosphate groups, those are going to be repelling one another. Remember the opposite charges repel one another and now you're sticking these opposite charges right next to one another. So you can imagine that just like you, like if you're holding a clamp spring, it's going to take energy to kind of hold that. It's going to kind of take energy in order to for, hold those phosphate groups together. And therefore, if you're able to like cut one off or cut two off, well, now what's going to happen is it's kind of like unclamping the spring. And just like if you had a ball on the end of the spring that could like fly across the room, if you have, um, that would be like using it and giving energy. Here you're getting energy too. But instead of flying a ball across the room, you're using it in order to drive reactions that are unfavorable, or at least that's hopefully you're, how you're going to use it. And so we'll talk about how basically instead of just releasing a phosphate group and like letting off some heat, which wouldn't be very helpful, um, we're actually going to couple like transfer of phosphate groups to make good leaving groups and to help um, facilitate reactions in different ways. So releasing that charge is one thing, but that's not that's not all. And energy benefits also are going to come about from having greater resonance stabilization and hydration than ATP. And so I'll talk more about these things in a second. Before you, we get too far, I want you to know, remember, remember, remember that the actual breaking of a bond is always going to be endergonic. It's going to require energy. So it's not that the breaking of ATP generates energy. Remember going back to our enthalpy, we were talking about like forming interactions was going to be favorable was going to give you energy. We had all those with our enzymes. We had that binding energy that we were getting. And now we're saying, okay, we're breaking a bond and we're getting energy. What the heck is going on? Basically, you have to consider the reactions that you're going to then make. Um, and so basically, first of all, if that bond is weak or unstable, it's not going to need that much as big of a required energy to, to break it. And then what you have to consider is basically once you break it, are you forming new interactions? And if so, if you're forming more of those new interactions, you're getting more favorable interactions than you had before, um, then basically what can happen is that you end up with the reaction being more exergonic or energy releasing overall. And so it turns out that when you break that ATP, well, now you're going to get good solvation. You have the, you, and you get the entropic benefit of like increasing the number of molecules and now those molecules, those increased molecules, they can kind of hang out with more water. So you get hydration. You get these positive interactions forming that are going to be making it more favorable.
And so the key reasons why inherently, um, just based on that delta G naught prime, where that comes from, that inherent, um, that inherent energy source of these like quote unquote high energy bonds, basically what's gonna happen is that you have that, when you hydrolyze it, you relieve that charge repulsion, you're unclamping the spring. Then once the release phosphate group, it's going to have better resonance on its release form. It can do more resonance than it could when it was in these in this form. And remember, resonance makes things really, really happy. They like being able to spread out the charge. Um, there's also benefits you can get from like ionization of the phosphate groups um, and things like this. And basically, bottom line is you get this big change in free energy. And so, yeah, here it's like in kilojoules per mole, so minus 30.5. A lot of places use kilocals, a lot of places use kilojoule, and so often you'll see them both. Okay, so let's do some examples. Let's try to figure out, okay, well, if we have this delta G naught prime of minus 7.3 kilocals per mole, and that's telling us that if we started with standard conditions of them, so we started with one molar of all of these things and we let it get to equilibrium, it would give off this much energy. And now I want to I want to say, okay, well, how much of what would the what would the concentrations of these be at equilibrium, or at least the relative concentrations of them? So write an equation for KEQ in terms of products and reactants. So just like any reaction, but basically what we could say is our KEQ is products over reactants. So this is going to be our ADP times our inorganic phosphate over our ATP. So now go ahead and write an equation for KEQ in terms of our delta G naught prime. So I'm gonna start by just rearranging things and before entering, putting any numbers in here. Basically, we can rearrange things. What we end up with is that KEQ is going to be equal to E to the minus delta G naught prime over RT. And now I can go ahead and plug in numbers. And so our KEQ is going to be equal to E to the uh, minus, minus, so plus um, 7.3 over 0.592. So we're in kcals per mole here, so that's why I'm using this value. Now, before you actually go and enter this into your calculator, though, let's do some, let's do some intuition. Let's think about what we would expect, and then if our answer doesn't match our expectations, then maybe we did some calculation wrong. So it's always good to kind of think ahead, um, and that's also helps you understand what these concepts are. So with this reaction, would we expect KEQ to be um, greater than one or less than one? Remember what KEQ means. KEQ is telling us the concentration of products over reactants at equilibrium. If we have a reaction that's going to be thermodynamically favorable, um, like inherently, then what's going to happen is that at equilibrium, we're going to have more products than reactants. And so our KEQ is going to be greater than one. In this case, we have a negative delta G, so we're um, not prime. And so basically this is telling us we're favorable. And so we would expect that our KEQ is going to be, um, is going to be bigger than one. And so now we can go ahead and do the calculations. And what are we going to get? We're going to get that our KEQ is about 2.3 times 10 to the 5, which I would say, I would say that's pretty positive. Um, what this is saying is basically that's like 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, um, 230,000 times more of your of the um eight, the products than the reactants when you're at that equilibrium. So pretty impressive. But that's at equilibrium. That's like saying if that's based on equilibrium. And are we actually at equilibrium? So these are if measured cellular con concentrations are 15 millimolar of ATP, 1.5 millimolar ADP and 15 millimolar of um, inorganic phosphate, is this reaction at equilibrium inside of living cells? So how do we know if we're at equilibrium? 
Well, basically, we need to calculate our Q and compare that to our KEQ. And if they're the same, we're at equilibrium. But if they're not, we're not. And so what's our Q? Well, our Q is just going to be our products over reactants. It's going to be our ADP times our inorganic phosphate over our ATP. So now we can go ahead and put numbers in. Um, so basically 0 0.0015 molar times 0 0.015 molar over 0 0.015 molar. Now these are going to cancel each other out. And what you're left with is 0 0.0015 molar. Is that equal to KEQ? Well, how do we know? Well, remember we found a minute ago that our KEQ was like 2.3 times 10 to the fifth. And now we're basically saying 1.5 um, times 10 to the one, two, three, to the minus three. So are we at equilibrium? No, we're far from equilibrium. Are we above or below KEQ? We're below KEQ. And what does this tell us? Basically, this is telling us that we have not enough of our products as we would need for equilibrium. We have more of our reactants. We've got more of that ATP. We have a higher amount of ATP than we'd find at equilibrium. And so, well, equilibrium is going to drive it to the right. That it's going to be a favorable, more and more favorable, as higher as we have that initial concentration compared to the final, to the product concentration at equilibrium. So the further we are, the more ATP we start with, the bigger that ratio of ADP, ATP to ADP, the more drive we'll have, the more positive drive we'll have, the more power the ATP will have. It's not just that the power of the ATP is coming from that, that like inherent favorability. It's also coming because we're kind of, um, stacking the deck so we have more ATP. We're keeping it at these artificially high concentrations in order to keep this drive going, to keep this keep its power powerful. And so what is the actual power? What's our delta G under these conditions? And so we can go ahead and calculate it. So go ahead and take a stab at trying to calculate this. So basically we just need to plug and chug. So we're gonna say delta G, is equal to, and if we're saying under at like 37 degrees Celsius, so we're at 310 kelvins, um, then what we're going to want to do is basically we can then plug in minus R, our R is still, we're in terms of um, kilocals per mole here. So, my, so minus 1.987, and this is calories per mole, which we need to be careful about, times R, 310 kelvins. And then this is going to be times the natural log of our KEQ. And what did we say our KEQ was? That was going to be about 2.3 times 10 to the fifth over our Q, which we just found um, was going to be equal to 1.5 times 10 to the minus third. Okay. And now go ahead and plug this in. So when we plug this in, we end up getting that delta G is equal to about minus 1.16 times 10 to the fourth calories per mole, which is equal to about minus 11.6 kilocals per mole, which we can see is even much more powerful than we had with our delta G, G naught prime. So basically, we get more power because we have a higher concentration of ATP. But this also means that when we go and we use ATP, we're gonna the amount of our fuel decreases, the fuel itself loses its potency. So as we get closer to that equilibrium, basically the amount of energy that we get released by burning ATP, it actually decreases. The fuel loses its potency. So our cells need to be able to keep a high ATP, ADP, and as we'll see, ATP, AMP ratio in order to keep it so that that delta G is going to be very negative.
So if you want to actually be able to use ATP for like doing stuff, we're going to have to keep making more of it. And it turns out that when we're making it more favorable to break down ATP, we're making it less favorable to make ATP. We're making it harder and harder to make more ATP as we make more ATP. Because remember that if something is favorable in the forward direction, it's unfavorable in the reverse direction. The more favorable it is in the forward direction, the less favorable it is in the reverse direction. And so if we want to go and want to take this reaction in reverse, we want to actually take ADP and add a phosphate group to get ATP. Well, that's going to be really, really hard. It's uh, how hard is it going to actually be? Well, under these conditions, it would be 11.6 kilocals per mole positive. You'd have to put in that much energy in order to make ATP. And so our cells have to go through like a lot of work, constantly making more ATP in order to keep up. Because, and it's really important that you keep these levels steady, going back to our idea of steady state, we want these cells to be able to have a constant supply of ATP. We're going to need to, if we want to use that ATP, we're going to need to keep making ATP. And if we want to keep that drive hot for the power of ATP, we need to make a lot, a lot of ATP. And if we want to make a, that do that, then basically we're going to need a lot of energy in order to make more ATP. And so our cells are going to keep ATP um, high, but not too high. Because if you have it too high, well, then it's going to be going off all the, over the place. And it's even harder, harder, harder to make more. And so what we're going to do is basically we're going to have a fairly constant level of ATP that's going to be ideal. And it's going to be far from equilibrium. So we're far favoring the ATP over the others. And then basically we can kind of monitor the ratios and to know like whether we want to break down molecules or make molecules we'll see how we can have all sorts of layers of regulation based on molecules like based on enzymes and things being regulated either directly by atp um, by phosphorylation by adp by amp all these various ways in order to kind of keep that supply at a level that you want so i know there's a lot of information but here's some key takeaways one is that the standard free energy change, delta G naught, is kind of like telling us about the inherent favorability. So if you were to mix these molecules together, let them reach equilibrium, what would you find more of? The products or the reactants? Well, if a reaction is favorable, you find more of the products, which would mean that you would have a negative delta G. And you would have a um, KEQ that's going to be greater than one. But if you have a reaction that's not favorable in the forward direction, you'd find more product, more reactants than products at equilibrium. Your KEQ is going to be less than one. You're going to basically have that the delta G is going to be positive. However, things are not usually at, in, um, at these standard conditions. And so we need to take that into account. We need to figure out the actual free energy change and for that, we want to figure out delta G. And that is going to depend on the actual concentrations of things at this moment. Um, so that's going to depend on our reaction quotient. Um, so products of reactants again, but here we're not at equilibrium. And because we're not at equilibrium, we have the drive to move towards equilibrium. And so it's this difference between the K, the Q and the KEQ, between whether we have more products than we want at equilibrium or whether we don't have as many products as we want at equilibrium. If we have more of our reactants um, than our products, basically what like then we would have at equilibrium, we're going to be driven towards making more products. And if we have less of our product than we would have um. So if we have more of our reactants um, than we than products, like that we would then we would have at equilibrium, we're going to be driven to the right. We're going to make more of those products. But if we're building up our products, well, now what's going to happen is basically we're slowing down that drive. And so if we slow down that drive as we approach equilibrium, we're making it so that the our reaction is less useful. And so we have to, if we want to keep a, even a favorable reaction, if we want to keep it favorable, we're going to have to manipulate the concentrations. So this is why, like, inherently, yes, ATP is favorable to hydrolyze. 
But the real power of it comes in part from us keeping these artificially high concentrations of ADP, ATP. And then by keeping that ATP, keeping the power of that ATP going, we can then use it, we can couple it to reactions that on their own would not be favorable. But with when using them in this coupled way, we're able to drive those reactions. And by having it so that all these different enzymes can use the same molecule ATP, and we have all these pathways that are going to produce ATP from different fuel sources, well, now we have a really powerful system, a system capable of life. And so I hope that that was exciting for you. And I hope that you're ready to dive more into this exciting field of metabolism.